Hello from LPL Financial. Welcome to The Talking Point. I'm your host, Quincy Crosby. Hello, everyone. This is Quincy Crosby. It is Tuesday morning, and it is The Talking Point. It is September 6th. Thank you so much for joining me on this call. I appreciate it. First of all, before we get started, I want to mention something about the close of the second quarter earnings season. You know, coming in, there was tremendous pessimism over how companies could perform given the headwinds, given the difficulties with supply chain uh, uh, challenges and so forth. And also, uh, you know, in terms of guidance, that the guidance couldn't be good, meaning what, what were they saying about looking ahead? Well, most of the numbers are in right now. And we always talk about margins, don't we? Margins. It means you get the money coming in, which is your revenue growth, right? You get toward the bottom line, but you've got to pay people. You've got to pay for commodities. You've got to pay for uh, rent, whatever it is that your business requires. And uh, those are the margins. And the, the expectations were that margins were going to be crushed. I mean, you'd hear that term over and over again. Well, when the numbers are in, and we saw a bit of it, you know, going through the earnings season, because it, it did, it was pretty good, darn good. And what we have is this, the net profit margins for the second quarter were 12.3%. Five years ago, it was 11.2%. And a year ago, it was 13.1%. So obviously, it was lower than uh, compared with the second quarter last year. But it was good, especially considering all of the pessimism associated with the second quarter. And 75% of the S&P 500 companies beat expectations, which was also good. And as everyone knows, the guidance was mixed, but so many companies surprised to the upside in terms of what they earn, but also in terms of their guidance and, and how they see the full year. So I just want to point that out because we're getting, you know, closer to the third quarter earnings season. And again, there's pessimism. And uh, I won't get into it in this call. But just understand it all comes down to the company at the company level. What are they seeing? What are their customers seeing? And by the way, how are they reacting? By the way, too. As we go into this week, given the selling, so many selling days, uh, we're going in with forward earnings, S&P 500 forward earnings at 16.7 times 12-month forward earnings. The 10-year average is 17 times forward earnings. And the five-year average is 18.6 times forward earnings. So we're going in with a lower bar for companies. And that, by the way, that helps because it, it's not perfection. You know, when, when a market is, is at 20 times forward earnings or 21 times forward earnings, as we have seen, uh, it is priced for perfection and you have to deliver. So coming in with uh, lower expectations actually do, does help. So that said, uh, as we go into the shortened week, a couple of things on the agenda this week. One is that uh, we have a number of Federal Reserve speakers, and the reason that's important is we want to make sure that they are, you know, speaking in unison. Some of them like to go rogue, but the point is, unless it comes out of Chairman Powell's mouth, you know, the market listens, it does matter. But you, if they're speaking in unison, the same script, so to speak, uh, then it tells us this is orchestrated. This is what they want the market to hear. So that's going to be important because it is a full roster of Federal Reserve speakers. In addition this week, and this would be uh, for tomorrow, we're going to have the Institute for Supply Management Services Index, the ISM Index. We'll also have a version of it coming from the Standard & Poor Global U.S. Services Purchasing Manager Index. This is very important for the market because, first of all, we're a service sector economy, right? That's the first thing. And the other thing is what we want to hear, and I say this over and over again, is new orders. What, what are the new orders? How many, how many do you have? And also... Uh, hiring expectations. So remember with the ISM, this is the Institute for Supply Manager, Purchasing Managers, um, the line in the sand is 50. 
above 50, we are in expansion mode. Below 50, it's contraction. Needless to say, uh, we look to see if we're above 50, are we inching lower? And that's important too. But right now, the last report was at 55.5%. It was lower than uh, the month before, but just a tad. So we're going to pay attention very closely to what they have to say. And, you know, the, some of the parts, the components to the report will also include uh, input costs. You know, what do they have to say about that? But the reason I stress keeping your eye open, your ears open for that report is it has a positive correlation with how the market ultimately does. And when I say ultimately, I don't mean years down the road. I mean some months down the road. And when they're doing well, the market typically is also on track for, for, for doing well. And I know it sounds difficult right now, right? Given, given what's happened in the market. So in any case, on Wednesday, we're going to have the Beige Book. And I follow the Beige Book. I've said on this call many times, the Beige Book is what it used to be called, right? They haven't changed the name. It sounds dull, right? The Beige Book. But it's important because it is an anecdotal report from the Federal Reserve banks across the country. And actually, they're fairly up to date. They talk to small business owners, large corporations, banks to see what's going on. How are conditions in their, in their region? And in a period like this, we want to know. We want as much up-to-date information as we can get. So that takes on increasingly uh, important role, given that the market is so focused on what the Federal Reserve is going to do at its meeting at the end of this month. And then on Thursday, obviously, the uh, initial jobless claims are important. But Jerome Powell speaks uh, at 9, 10 p.m. Uh, on Thursday, September 8th. So that's going to be important. We want to see if he's changed his view at all. We don't think it's going to happen. We think he is going to stick to the script that the Fed is going to bring back price stability, and they'll do it at any cost. And that's important because that's what has the market nervous. But the market is afraid that the Fed raising interest rates, perhaps 75 basis points uh, at its September uh, uh, meeting at the end of this month. The market is torn between 50 basis points and 75 basis points. Now, at the same time, the quantitative tightening is gaining traction. And that would be, uh, you know, instrumental in how tight financial conditions become. So, They're unwinding their balance sheet. Remember, their balance sheet ballooned with treasury bonds and mortgage-backed securities uh, at the very beginning of the pandemic. And they did it in order to bring interest rates down, down dramatically, so the cost of capital was next to zero, and trying to help the uh, housing market by buying mortgage-backed securities. But now, uh, they are winding that down, and that will add to tightening. How much, we don't know. They don't know either. But at a minimum, it will be the equivalent of probably about 25 basis points. But it could be, it could be more. So the market is going into a period right now of unknown territory. Keep in mind that when Chairman Powell tried to normalize interest rates back in 2018 by unwinding the balance sheet, uh, it didn't go so well. I won't go into it on this call, but you just take a look at, at, at how how it uh, uh, unfolded. And they weren't even fighting inflation, okay? They were not fighting inflation back in 2018. So in any event, this is a, an extremely busy week uh, for the market. Also this week, we have central banks, uh, other central banks meeting, the Bank of uh, Canada, And also, and probably more important for the U.S., is the European Central Bank. Last time, they raised rates 50 basis points. And that was a surprise, by the way. The market had expected 25 basis points. But inflation is rising, and it's rising dramatically, especially as gas prices, uh, natural gas prices rise. Now, here's the issue for them. Do they front load 
Front loading means what the Fed has been doing, raising rates, raising rates, and raising rates. In other words, doing it kind of all, all at once, seemingly all at once. Uh, at the Jackson Hole, Wyoming meeting, a number of officials from the European Central Bank uh, gave speeches in which they recommended exactly that, and they recommended going full throttle, even 75 basis points, perhaps at the next meeting. Why would they do it? They would do it because they have a problem with inflation, but they also know that there's going to be a problem with GDP, gross domestic product. Uh, it's going down. It's not going up. Uh, it's going to be a very, very difficult winter for um, especially Germany, which is the largest economy within the European um, Union. And so why not do it now? That's exactly the point. Why not do it now? So what does that have to do with us here in the U.S.? It's about the U.S. dollar. When you have another central bank raising rates at a really tight clip, what it does is it, it will go and it will become stronger. That central bank's currency, in this case it would be the euro, would actually get stronger. And in this case it would get stronger vis-a-vis -vis the U.S. dollar, especially if they go with 75 basis points in the Eurozone. And if the market believes that we will go with 50 basis points, in other words, they get, they get more hawkish and we get a little bit less hawkish. That could ease the U.S. dollar a little bit. And that's a good thing because what it does is it eases financial conditions right? A weaker dollar does ease financial conditions. It's not a, do a U.S. dollar that's collapsing. It's just easing. And also, it's very good for the S&P 500 with companies that sell overseas and where, um, you know, with a strong dollar, uh, our products become more expensive. So keep our, your eyes open for that because the U.S. dollar has gotten even stronger over the last uh, number of trading sessions uh, for a variety of reasons. Uh, and and it, most of it actually does stem from the idea that the Fed means it. They mean that they are going to go and they're going to make sure that price stability is resumed at any cost. Also, uh, we had a very good report on the labor market last Friday, right? It was a good report, but it also showed, and this is important, that more people are coming back to the labor force. Uh, when they break it down, women especially are coming back into the labor force looking for jobs. So when you have more people looking for jobs, they're looking. Remember, they're looking. They didn't necessarily get the jobs, but they're, they're out there looking. Um, typically, the unemployment rate will inch higher, which is exactly what happened. It moved up to 3.7% from 3.5%. But a couple of things were important. One was the work week was actually a little bit weaker, which is what the Fed wants, by the way. And uh, we also saw that uh, wage wages inched up just a tad, but not enough to cause a problem for the Fed. It wasn't like it was, you know, a major uptick in, in, in wages. But the number was uh, in line with market expectations, just over 300,000 new jobs. Also, the month before where we had 528,000 new jobs, that was revised downward. And that's also something the Fed will be happy about. But why, why, I just want to point this out, why would the Fed be really positive on more people coming back into the workforce because it means more people looking for jobs. And it also means, therefore, that employers have more people to choose from. And therefore, they're not held as hostage to raising uh, wages. That's the reasoning, by the way. So the more people coming back into the workforce means that um, there are more people looking perhaps at the same job, and therefore the employers do not have to raise wages by that much. D those who don't follow this call, I want to go over that just for a second. And the reason is that when wages move higher, companies raise their prices. And if it becomes entrenched, you know, psychologically, that everyone expects their wages to move higher, companies will keep raising the prices. And that creates what we call a wage price spiral. The Fed wants to break the back of any potential wage price spiral. So there you, you go. So September 13th, we will have the consumer price index. And I think that is going to help the market decide 
what the Fed will be doing uh, at the end of September at the uh, Federal Reserve meeting. Uh, we'll see if inflation kicks down at a faster pace, maybe giving the Fed the ability to go 50 basis points as opposed to 75. So while the market, uh, this is a short week, there's a lot going on this week, but I want to end where I started. The second quarter earnings season beat expectations. And that's good news because it tells you that these headline fears get out of control. And, um, you know, we ultimately pay attention to what companies are telling us. And that's what the market needs to do as we go into the third quarter earnings season uh, down the road. So take good care. Please get in touch if you have any questions. Have a very good week and follow the market. Uh, the market's looking for a catalyst to move higher. And today, uh, I, you're looking at a market that looks like it's in the green, but let's pay attention because we saw that sell off on Friday. Uh, we had a good opening and it sold off as traders thought, I don't want to be in this market for a three-day weekend. I want to take my profits and I want to get out of here. It's still a trader's market, just as it was last week. It's still a trader's market this week until we have more clarity from the Federal Reserve. Thank you so much. Take care. This material was prepared by LPL Financial. It's for general information only and is not intended to provide specific advice or recommendations for any individual. There is no assurance that the views or strategies discussed are suitable for all investors or will yield positive outcomes. Investing involves risks, including possible loss of principal. Any economic forecast set forth in the podcast may not develop as predicted and are subject to change. References to markets, asset classes, and sectors are generally regarding the corresponding market index. All indexes are unmanaged and cannot be invested into directly. Index performance is not indicative of the performance of any investment and do not reflect fees, expenses, or sales charges. All performance reference is historical and is no guarantee of future results. All information referenced in the podcast is believed to be from reliable sources. However, we make no representation as to its completeness or accuracy. Securities and advisory services offered through LPL Financial, a registered investment advisor and broker-dealer, member FINRA and SIPC. Insurance products are offered through LPL or its licensed affiliates. To the extent you are receiving investment advice from a separately registered independent investment advisor that is not an LPL affiliate, please note LPL makes no representation with respect to such entity. If your financial professional is located at a bank or credit union, please note Note that the bank or credit union is not registered as a broker dealer or investment advisor. Registered representatives of the LPL may also be employees of the bank or credit union. These products and services are being offered through LPL or its affiliates, which are separate entities from and not affiliates of the bank or credit union. Securities and insurance offered through LPL or its affiliates are not insured by the FDIC or NCUIA or any other government agency, not bank or credit union guarantee guaranteed, not bank or credit union deposits or obligations, and may lose value.